Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Hello, listeners. Thanks again for joining me this week. I have an awesome guest for you today. With me is Margaret Stowawe, and I did it. I'm pretty sure I got her name right. And she's going to be talking to us about a variety of things, but one of the things we're going to focus on is journaling and adding poetry to our journaling. So thank you for joining me, Margaret. Yes, I'm I'm so happy to be here with you and, and to all the listeners. Thank you for joining us. So you've had quite the journey and career in caregiving. So let's start with you telling us about yourself and your journey, and we'll go from there. Yeah. Okay. So um, in 2012, it became pretty clear to me that my mom was needing help. And at first I was in denial about it. I thought, oh, she's just having a lapse. Um, She's tired. This is going to go away. And then there was this defining moment. For me, it was the pile of mail building on her table. And I realized she was not uh, addressing her personal business. And when I actually started taking over, it took hours and hours to um, iron out like what fell by the wayside, what what wasn't paid, um, appointments. And this was difficult for me because I, I did work full time as a librarian. And um, But I do want to say that for five years, I was able to keep my mom semi-independent and semi-autonomous. I credit her neighbors. My mom lived in uh, low-income senior housing and was very friendly with many of her neighbors who were very neighborly, by the way. And um, they would call me at work sometimes and tell me some things that they thought I might want to know about. And so this was actually quite helpful. And the other helpful thing was my workplace was very near to where my mother lived. Um, I kept up with that as long as I could. But as we all know, uh, things don't go on forever. And my mom had a fall and her downstairs neighbor heard it and called the paramedics and called me. And uh, my mother ended up in the hospital and then in skilled nursing. And um, as we know, when you take a person with dementia out of their routine, the decline accelerates, which is exactly what happened to her. And it was not good. My mother um, became extremely agitated. Um, She was starting to have behavior problems. There was even violence. And um, so she ended up in uh, skilled nursing for the last nine or 10 months of her life. And she cried every single day. And I would come after work every day to, you know, even though I, I wasn't the primary caregiver anymore, still, I was there to provide context to her situation, which she hated, to provide comfort. Um, and, uh, yes, so it, it, it was overwhelming as you can imagine. And one way that people like me who are writers and poets process is through the writing process. And you, you, you've mentioned journaling. Um, that is such a a common practice among all writers. That's kind of ground zero. In fact, Uh, And from journals often come ideas for poems or or if you're an essay writer, you can get so many great ideas from journaling. I I believe research has shown how therapeutic that is. And, And poetry is a particularly handy tool for caregivers. And I'll tell you why. We're really short of time. (laughs) We don't have time. We don't have time to write a novel. And we don't, I didn't have time to read a novel even, but I I did have time to read some poems and I did have time to write poems. And um, poems are very uh, suitable because they have the ability to compress 
into very powerful, nuanced images and, and complexities that, um, you know, are, are very striking. And they hit, I believe, at a human core experience of the caregiver, you know, as we try to navigate this um, journey, which is quite, quite challenging. Well, I like poetry that when you read the right poem at the right time, it just, it makes you, it like touches your heart. It makes you think. And sometimes it's almost like, yes, those are my words too, or those are my feelings or that kind of emotion. And that's, that's what I like about poetry. And I haven't seen Alzheimer's poetry until I talked to you planning for this recording. And, you know, I would assume that a lot of people would find, would be afraid that writing about this journey would be like really depressing. <laughs> well, it can be, but we've discovered, well, we'll talk about too. Um, of course, it, it all comes down to this book that I co-edited. Um, when we started getting submissions for the book, there were a lot of uh, very difficult, sad issues that came up, but there was also hilarity sometimes. I mean, you know, sometimes the, the person that to whom you're providing care, you know, they can be a hoot. It, it's dementia, Alzheimer's, it, it, the person is still there and there are still elements of who they were. And my mom, for example, was extremely witty, extremely funny. And that did not change. I, I mean, I, I wish I could have her sense of humor. It was, <laughs> you, you know, it just was really uh, quite, quite wonderful uh, to let, be able to laugh together with her. Um, so, yeah, I, didn't get, I didn't get witty with my mom. She wasn't, that wasn't part of her general personality. So definitely wasn't there with Alzheimer's, unfortunately, but there were times that she would say things like, well, my brain just doesn't work right anymore. And it'd be like, oh, you know, you'd mm. hear it. You'd be like, oh, and then sometimes, you know, but I could spin that into something funny. And then, so I I could get her to laugh, but it, yeah. it took some effort to figure out how to, you know, to, to instead of saying to her, well, my brain doesn't work so good anymore. You think <laughs> mm. Is to you know just make some kind of joke about it because that was the only way I could deal with that. Those comments would come out of the blue and it'd be like, oh, just like hit you right yeah. in the heart. And and how how can you address that? It's so true and and it's it's the tragedy. It's heartbreaking. Um, and this was in the very later stages, and sometimes you know it'd be like, does she is she aware that her brain's not working, or is that just? her flippant comment because, you know, just kind of like a toss off comment about, you know, like, cause she couldn't find the words or whatever. It, that was a little bit haunting to not have that answer. It was like, Ooh, okay. I always treated her like, you know, she was at least aware, right? but I tried not to play it. I tried to play it down. Like, Oh yeah, we all have those kind of moments. Yeah. I, I hear what you're saying. And, and, um, I think my mom was aware, and I think this was what, what her agitation was about. This terrified her. And um, one thing that annoys me about people who don't have experience with dealing with people with dementia is that think about all of those terrible TV sitcoms with the older person who is so stupid. My mom was never stupid. And um, yes, I, I, I just, couldn't believe sometimes some of the condescending behavior that she had to experience. So uh, when you say that, yeah. yeah. We definitely need a very big educational um, effort because the community that I live in is, it's a just, well, it used to be vacation homes, then it was a retirement community. And now it's whoever could afford to live here basically but there are the population skews a little bit older just because, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of people that make comments. Well, you know, I got the Alzheimer's, you know, my brain doesn't, 
I can't remember stuff anymore. It's just a normal part of aging. And then, uh, then I got to get on my soapbox and educate them. And I hate that. It's like, we're in a social situation. Right. I don't want to have to be that person. <laughs> hey, you know what? My younger coworkers forget things. We all forget things. And, you know, it's it's unfair to just say, oh, it's aged people. It, we all just need to um, understand that, yes, probably your cognitive abilities will decline with age, but that. It's nothing to say about your intellectual capacity or your ability to, you know, still enjoy humor. Um, you know, hopefully you can enjoy that as long as possible. So um, I, I compare our brains as we age to, you know, right now, like in our teens and younger adult years, you know, we have like the most updated, fastest processing computer. And, you know, when you get a computer that's 10 years old, it, it works not so great. It might be a little slow. You might have to give it a little thump up the side. <laughs> and that's just kind of how our brains work. They do work. They just are a little slower. So mm -hmm. if you're having cognitive issues, like you're forgetting stuff, you're getting lost, you can't remember important, you know, like paying the bills and that stuff, that's something to be concerned about. But yes. we all have those moments where uh, you, you walk into the kitchen, you're like, what's going <laughs> in here again? And that's just because we're not paying attention. Right. Exactly. So, yeah. Um, you know, I, I love my mother so much. Um, I miss her so much. And, um, you know, I, I written poems about caregiving while I was caring for her. And now afterward, even, I mean, some of that stuff, it's like composting. It's like, you've got to let it turn and turn and turn over and, and become this rich material uh, sometimes in the moment, it's just very hard. Um, one of our contributors to the book, which I, I think I should pick it up and talk about this book, Storms of the Inland Sea, Poems of Alzheimer's and Dementia Caregiving. This is co-edited by me and um, Jim Kokus. So um, anyway, Speaking about journaling, just to go back to that, is that one of the contributors who is a friend of mine cared for her husband uh, in his last years. And she said, I just was way too busy to write poetry, but I journaled all the time. And after he passed, I took that material from the journals. And that's when I wrote my book, After Beauty. And, um, you know, it was a wonderful you know, very emotional, striking tribute to their relationship together and and, and his decline and then her caregiving is a total big picture. Um, so books do come out of this. Art does come out of this. And, and journaling, as you know, uh, and, and also because of your own artistic practices that we were talking about previously, they're really good for us. They're so healing. Um, they... You know, they put, it, art gets shortchanged sometimes, but really uh, it's so important for us. We call it the humanities sometimes, and, and it's because it makes us more human, more empathetic. That's true. I'm so yeah. terrible with numbers, well, with math. <laughs> I can add and subtract as long as you get a dollar sign in front of it. That's my entrepreneurial half. But my artist half is like, I still have nightmares from doing word problems in school and don't ask me to do a word <laughs> problem because I will tell you no. I've had people suggest that I, I try doing math in my head as a cognitive exercise. Mm. It's like, no, because the stress that it causes is bad for my brain. <laughs> um, yeah. But I do, I do challenge myself cognitively. I just don't generally do math. But I was going to ask a question. One of the reasons I didn't journal during my mom's mm. journey journey journal, just too many words the same there, is twofold. Um, I wasn't sure that I would ever want to reread it. Um, it was, I was like afraid to be that raw and open because I'm like, you know, I don't know how, how other people would feel reading this. And, you know, I didn't kind of feel like I had time and I, I had so many apprehensions. I didn't really see the benefits. So um, my, my thing was, Anytime I, you could tell by listening to podcasts, what's what struggle I was having with my mom, because 
if I had a problem that I couldn't have the, I didn't have the answer to, I found somebody to talk to who had the answer. <laughs> so that Good was strategy. Yeah, it worked really well. Well, I figured if I had that question, other people had to have the question. So um, now I just, I'm still learning, which is great because, you know, my mom's been gone for three years almost. And, you know, I don't have problems with her anymore, <laughs> but I watch other people's stories. So how do you, you know, if you're somebody like me and you're kind of hesitant to journal because you're not sure you want to actually commit some of that stuff down to paper, you don't feel like you have time how would you suggest, what would you suggest to somebody like me to kind of get us over that hump? Well, Because I have I, a whole book that I've written in my head. I just got to put it down on pixels or whatever. It's not on, on digital paper. <laughs> well, some people uh, like you would talk it out with a friend or a professional, you know, somebody in the field who, you know, specifically knows what you need to find out about or need to express about. Um, I do want to say for myself, when I journal, I get the cheapest notebooks from the dollar store, not a nice, beautiful journal, because I want to give myself permission to write the worst crap possible, <laughs> if, if that's what comes out. Now, I have a stack of journals right now like this. It would be like this, except I burned the other ones, and I may burn these. I'm not sure I want other people to see this either. It is raw. It is some of it is not nice. And um, I don't think if I were to meet an untimely end, I, I wouldn't feel good about having those around. Sometimes we writers talk to each other about, well, what are we going to do with all of these journals? And some people are serious about like keeping them and they're going to be their legacy or something. You know, when I burned my first round of journals, it was such a liberating feeling. It was almost like I'm getting rid of all of the this past stuff. I've, I've worked through it. I've processed it. I'm past it. I'm going to burn it. Some people do that on New Year's. You know, they'll they'll burn something that they're trying to get rid of from the past year that they feel they've overcome. Um, some people, uh, by the way, they... Uh, like to record like ideas or or um, sentences or images that come to them. They'll they'll record them on their phone. So that's another thing you can do. Um, maybe you're more of a visual person and you just want to, you know, put it out on paper as an image. You know what you're feeling. You know if if it's like somebody with a screamy face or. So, you know, writing just comes to me, but other people might create music, create a drawing. Um, I, I say go for it. Um, but yes, I, I am a word person. Uh, in fact, I, you know, the written word works far better for me than auditory processing, which is not really my strong point. And I, I don't tell this to a lot of people, but here I am telling people because I go to poetry readings and it's really hard for me to focus and listen as I would need to. But when they project the poem at the same time, or if I have the book with me, then I have these two modalities. And I really appreciate the work far better uh, when I'm able to see it on the page. So I love to, you know, put things on the page as well. Um, that makes sense. I'm really visual. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I told you as a photographer until October of 2020 and technology is really making that a difficult career. So I've like <laughs> finally decided I was tired of arguing with people why they needed me, but I am very visual. Um, so maybe that was why journaling wasn't, I always felt like I needed to do it, but I never felt like I really wanted to. So maybe that explains mm -hmm. it. And I can't draw for beans. So <laughs> well, I have I have to do other things. So I, I do do other things. I take pictures, you know, I try yes. to find beauty in the everyday, which I love. I live, a, I live in the Sierra foothills now, which is nice. Although it might snow this week. No, no, thank you. <laughs> normally we're, we're normally below the snow level, but I think we're going to get snow this week, at least for a day. So that should be interesting. I'll have to give myself a creative challenge on dealing with the snow because I like it warm. <laughs> I'm ready for spring. It is yeah. February 20th and I'm, I'm ready for, you know, 80 degrees and 
go out on the lake on my paddleboard with my dog. <laughs> it's been brutal weather. This is true. It, it's been a tough, you know, for us in Northern California, I, I sympathize with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm glad we're getting the rain, but you're just like, Lord, I don't like rain either. <laughs> I did. I did hear just for um, just a side note. I'm not a big mushroom fan. I don't really like the taste of most mushrooms, but we've had so much rain. We're having like a mushroom super bloom, which is not real pretty to look at, but <laughs> it's just an interesting fact anyway. So I believe you have, and I hope I forgot to remind you before we hit record. So I hope this isn't springing this on you. You had a poem you were going to read to us. It was about resisting showering, I believe. Oh, bathing. Yes. It's called The Bath by Holly J. Hughes. Um, and I'm happy to read that for you. Um, that would be great because so many people, that's a big struggle with their loved ones. And there's so many reasons why it's a struggle. And, you know, it'd be interesting to hear a poem about bathing. <laughs> now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains, I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about Neuro Reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. Okay, uh, this is called The Bath by Holly J. Hughes. The tub fills inch by inch as I kneel beside it, trail my fingers in the bright braid of water. Mom perches on the toilet seat and trants by the ritual until she realizes the bath is for her. Oh no, she says, drawing her three layers of shirts to her chest, crossing her arms and legs. Oh no, I couldn't, she repeats brow furrowing that look I now recognize like an approaching squall. I abandon reason, the hygiene argument, promise a Hershey's bar, if she will just please take off her clothes. Oh no, she repeats her voice rising. Meanwhile, the water is cooling. I strip off my clothes, step into it. Let the warm water take me completely, slipping down until only my face shines up, a moon mask. Mom stays with me, interested now, in this turn of events. I sit up. Will you wash my back, Mom? So much gone, but let this still be there. She bends over to dip the washcloth in the still warm water, squeezes it, lets it dribble down my back, leans over to rub the butter pat of soap, swiping each armpit, then rinses off the suds with long practice strokes. I turn around to thank her, catch her smiling, lips pursed, humming, still a mother with a daughter, whose back needs washing. <laughs> That's awesome. Isn't and it? You know, is that a true story also? I believe it may be, uh, although I am told, um, you know, we poets uh, understand that poetry is not always nonfiction. Sometimes people do take poetic license and make things up, and we are not to really assume that the the, the 
narrator of the poem is the poet. They might, in fact, take the opposite view of the person with dementia, or they might take the dog's view, or, you know, um, anyway, this was one of the, the most wonderful things. I, I wrote poems myself, but, but my friend Jim, who also was a caregiver for his father with Alzheimer's and wrote poetry about it, he was wondering if other people who were caregivers wrote poetry, and we had no idea. And I thought, oh, man, somebody beat us to this for sure. But I did the research, and nobody had done caregiving, the caregiving aspect. I mean, there were books of literature and poems and essays and stories with Alzheimer's and dementia, but nothing that took the focus of caregiving via poetry. And so we put out some calls for submissions in this very big um, magazine, and literary magazine that all the wordsmiths read. It's called Poets and Writers. And we were floored. I I thought at first maybe we just wouldn't get enough work, but we did. And, you know, for me, this was more important than prepping my own work for a book. I felt like I needed to do something for everybody to serve a, a bigger purpose, a wider community than just me, 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 and my, my, my struggle. And I just came to know so many people through this project. I um, you know, Holly, for example, she did do a, a poetry anthology about Alzheimer's, but it was um, not exclusively caregiving. And she gave me a lot of advice about uh, this book, for which I am I'm, I'm truly grateful. So um, she was amazing. Um, at first, I thought I was going to self-publish this book with Jim, but as time went on, I realized, you know what, I just, it's not about getting that book published. Anybody can do that with, you know, the, the Lulu or Amazon has their product where you can sell. It's all about distribution and marketing. And um, that's where I'm so grateful for our publisher, Shanti Arts, that stepped up and, and took us on. And um, Christine Cody over there, she she was just an amazing supporter. I'm truly grateful. She she helped us design and create this this beautiful book. Um, and it's 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 gone on to get support from other uh, sources. We got wonderful testimonials from some poets and also academics and the medical humanities field. We became an ALS author. Oh yeah, I know you and I both love ALS authors. Um, it's this wonderful resource and do pipe in if you know more about them. Um, they're a 501c3 and they vet a wide range of books on, on Alzheimer's and dementia, all aspects. I mean, there are children's books, there are are caregiving guides. There, there's books from medical professionals. It's it's quite astounding. They they have podcasts, they have blog posts, and their mission is to get this all to to get the good material out. They vet everything and to um, get it to the people who need it because we are a community. We we all have different paths. I mean, in my own book, some of us had more resources than others. Some of us, you know, weren't the primary caregiver. They were a part of a team. But no matter who we were, we all lost somebody before they died. And this is painful and very, very, very difficult. And we're, we're, we're we have this commonality that ties us all together. And one one thing that you didn't mention that they have on all's authors is actually fiction novels where there is a dementia Alzheimer's component. One of my favorites is called Blue Hydrangeas. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, I'm going to forget who wrote it now because <laughs> I'm terrible with names. It's one of the founders, though. And oh. it's a beautiful story. It's set in Cape Cod. And I love hydrangeas. So and I do have blue ones. So I love it. And the story is written, so it it's just beautiful. You feel like you're in Cape Cod. You feel the the fear when the husband loses the wife and 
you know, she wanders away or she doesn't stay put where she's supposed to. And you can relate to it really well, but it's, you know, it's, it's still uplifting and, you know, it's a little bit sad, but you know, it's, it's a good story. And there's another one I just read called, um, oh, it's about sorority sisters and they're in their eighties. It's Mm -hmm. kind of like Gil, not Gilmore girls. Um, (sighs) it's kind of early. I did my workout. My brain should be working. It's, um, golden girls with a twist, like a sorority and Alzheimer's twist. And it's a really good story. And what I like about those stories is they're very easy for other people to read. So we had the mm-hmm. TV show, um, was it This Is Us? The one with where um, the mom passed away from Alzheimer's. The spouse was taking care of her. They went through that whole journey. I did not watch that part because it was still a little too raw for me. I was like, I already just lived through this. I don't really want to watch it on the TV. But it educated people who may not have gone through this journey or who may know somebody that's going through this journey and now they understand it a little better because as we started this recording, we were saying how, you know, we need a huge educational outreach to the medical profession, to society in general, to, you know, um, first responders. I'm um, I'm actually going to Washington, D.C. to lobby our, our, our legislators, and that's not what they call it, but <laughs> that's basically what it is. And, you know, it's... It's important, you know, one of the bills they're trying to work on, and this is not why we're going to D.C. this current term, is educating the police force on somebody who is, you know, who may have a dementia causing disease and they're not resisting. They're not um, being uncompliant. They have no clue. You know, it's like they're trained. The police are trained like to yell and be very forceful and. I think that confuses people that don't have a problem, but you can imagine Uh what that would do to somebody with dementia. And there's been some pretty unfortunate and ugly stories about people with, you know, Alzheimer's essentially being abused by the police, but the police, they don't know. So it's like, it's a big problem. You know, it's not just, not just training that's going to solve that problem because obviously, you know, if somebody's being acting like they're impaired and not following directions and maybe a shop owner calls the police to get rid of this person and the police show up. That's not a police situation. That's a social worker situation, but we don't have that. So again, back to the education that we all need to share. Exactly. This is where fiction and poetry, I think help a lot. Well, you know, I am a poet and I always love to campaign for poetry, but research does show that fiction um, does help build empathy, much more so than, say, nonfiction. So um, reading about the characters and situations in a fictional setting are actually very, um, very productive in building compassion. That's good. I don't think I knew that. Yeah. As a librarian, we have to have training uh, in mental health issues and, and, um, We get people with dementia at the library. We get people with mental health problems, but we also get people who don't like it that those people are in the library. And they were saying, you know, um, the the trainer in one workshop said, well, maybe you could say, gee, I wonder if that person likes mystery or romance, you know, just as a way of building this commonality of bringing this person back to humanity because we tend to dehumanize people with especially some kind of neurodivergence, whether it's 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 autism or mental health problems or dementia. And these are human beings. This is like somebody's mom or dad or brother or sister. And um, well, anyway, the trainer of our workshop uh, did tell us about research where, where f- reading fiction does build empathy and um, highly recommends that. And, and and this is where all authors is great because they vet everything. So you know if they are vetting it, that it is a solid piece of literature or solid work. So and it's a passion project for them. They don't they don't personally oh, yeah. make a lot of money or any money doing this. So yeah, it's they're a great organization. And I don't know if I told you when we talked before, my paternal grandmother is the head librarian at a um school district 
she was and then i don't i don't know if i've my listeners have heard this story so i'll tell it quickly uh my dad went to africa two years in a row with rotary international they were doing um cataract surgeries the second year they realized before they went back for the second year they realized they needed to do some dental stuff and to get the dental equipment to um Zimba, Zambia, Africa, which is on the west-ish coast. It's not on the coast, but it's on the west, west-ish side of Africa, if you want to look it up. They had to fill up a uh, shipping container. And, you know, you can imagine a dental chair is heavy and big and, and not easily, you know, it's not square and compact like a box. So they got the bright idea to... Uh, fill up the shipping container with books and then they turned the shipping container into a library in the village where they were doing their work and my paternal grandmother being a librarian a book lover etc I have and I will try to figure out if I can post it it's a 10 minute recording she told me the story about how she helped get books to send to Africa she went to garage sales, um, library book sales. If you were at the bus stop and you closed a book and you looked like you were finished, she was like, snatch, I'll take that. Thank <laughs> you very much. I need it for the library in, in Africa. Um, she And she told everybody what she was doing. So a lot of times they would, you know, she would give a t maybe 20 bucks. Um, my paternal grandparents were extraordinarily frugal, which I also am, but I'm not quite as bad as they were. She would offer money and then pretty much coerce sweetly into them giving her more books. And I didn't know until the fall of 2020, they actually named the library after my dad. So oh, there's a man. legacy between my dad and my paternal grandmother in Africa with this library. And so I love to read. And so it's one of these days, maybe I'll make it to Zimba, Zambia, Africa, and I'll get to see this library and i think they've expanded it i'm having a hard time getting answers to those questions i have to like it's almost like a message in a bottle up the rotary chain to different people but it's you know i love that story because you know here's this older woman in antioch california that basically snatched every possible book she could get and they filled up this shipping container and turned the shipping container into a library in a village in africa yeah, it's the action and the vision of one person who cares. And mm -hmm. um, this is like the power of, of you know, seeing something that needs to be done, stepping up the plate, it's up to the plate and doing it. And, and, you know, just this whole beautiful idea about books. And, and as we're talking that the people will be learning new ideas. I'll be reading stories with characters that they may be able to identify with or they can learn about. Um, and it, it's all part of this wonderful um, circle. Um, so, you know, previously we talked a little bit about how when I was um, creating the book, as you create a book, you start looking for people that you might be able to align with that you can learn from, which I certainly did, or uh, also disciplines that I, I have to say, I learned about this new area of medicine called narrative medicine and the medical humanities, about which I had previously been unaware. But when I learned about it, I was just I knew I had to talk to people in the field and, and show them my book and ask their advice. And I actually got two uh, blurbs on the book cover from academics in the medical humanities, Dr. Brian Dolan of UCSF and Dr. Johanna Shapiro, who is a professor emeritus or emeriti, I believe, um, at um, UC Irvine. Um, so medical humanities and narrative medicine is so mind blowing to me. You know, we've all gone to the doctor and had the experience where we don't feel like we've been completely heard or, or understood. But in narrative medicine, um, the, the goal is for the healthcare uh, practitioner 
to look at the patient and think of that in terms of of a narrative. They are a person with an illness, but when did this illness hit a tipping point? Who is this person? Who who are the characters in their lives? What is this person's particular circumstance? And there's a narrative to an illness, to a person. And often, you know, we can see it and say a work of fiction, but when we look at a person, some of those um, abilities to read and analyze and understand fiction, it can be transferred to a person too. And so um, in classes of narrative medicine, uh, students are taught to do kind of a close reading and they may, they, they're encouraged to write because this is going to give them a bigger insight into development of character, development of situation, so that when they see the patient, um, they're looking at them not as a disease to be cured, but as a whole person that needs to be helped. And in fact, uh, a week from today, Jim and I are presenting a workshop for New York University Grossman School of Medicine uh, with a panel discussion and a poetry writing workshop. So we're really, really excited to know about the narrative med medicine and medical humanities and be able to partner with people um, to learn from them and to if we can offer something and I, I believe we can to to have that sharing so that'll be awesome I think the biggest problem we have with our healthcare system and diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's dementia etc you know frontal temporal dementia is none of those diseases are curable and there's <clears throat> excuse me not necessarily even treatments and i know my mom's original general physician left the practice it was a practice of multiple doctors and we got this very nice younger doctor very personable totally lousy with alzheimer's <clears throat> excuse me he just there was times you know the care home would be concerned that you had a UTI, which never was the case. I learned quickly how to, well, not quickly enough, but I learned how to delay dealing with it because rushing her to the doctor to find out she didn't have a UTI was getting frustrating. But I would literally bring her there and the impression he gave me as nice and as you know, kind as he acted in the office was, I can't fix her. I don't know why you're here. And at worst, that was the best scenario. Worst, he treated me like I was the damn driver, which was infuriating. So maybe if they had learned to, you know, understand her whole being and how her disease affected her and me and the rippling effect, you know, my sister, the grandkids, blah, 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 that might have helped him be. It wouldn't have changed that he couldn't help us very much, but it might have changed the feeling that I was always left with. So I think that. Narrative medicine is definitely something we need to do more of with these diseases that we can't cure or treat or any of that stuff. I am so glad that you're saying this, Jennifer. And the, something you mentioned, I took my mother to many doctor appointments, as do the, every caregiver. And I think there were there were two doctors who recognized me. One was her general practitioner. And the other was her cardiologist. And the cardiologist, one time I took my mother to an appointment and he he very compassionately took me aside and said, I know how very hard this must be for you. And Jennifer, nobody ever did that except for the general practitioner with whom we had a relationship already. It meant so much to me because it's not just it, this doesn't just affect one person. It affects so many people and we're suffering too. And so uh, actually in narrative medicine, they do address that there are other people involved and that they are playing a part in this as well. So we need to be addressed as well, because as you well know, being a caregiver, we do it with as much grace and forbearance and love as possible, but we are paying for it with often our own health, our own mm -hmm. financial resources, and it's depleting. <sighs> and it's 
it's a snowball effect. I know millennials that are taking care of parents and grandparents and they get to a point where, you know, if they, if they're lucky, I know one that works from home. So she basically has two full-time jobs blah, blah, and no support because she's an only child. And I know somebody else that, um, is taking care of a grandparent and they don't work. I mean, not that caregiving is not work. I'm not suggesting that, but they don't work at a career. And so what's going to happen when their, their loved one is gone. Now they're going to be in their late thirties, early forties, or people like me in their mid fifties, you know, and now maybe you're like, okay, well, I better hop back on the career train and like you know, earn some money. And, you know, again, with our capitalistic society, you know, we don't necessarily want to hire older people that might retire soon, but they look at you like you've just been this bum and you don't really necessarily have a bunch of skills when all you've done is high level management and problem solving, you know? So again, we're back to the education that's necessary. Again, and if I may, I want to give a shout out to Hilarity for Charity. We are HFC, Seth mm -hmm. and Lauren Rogan's nonprofit. And their particular focus is caregiving, but the younger caregiver. My uh, nephew was a caregiver for both my uncle and my father while he's trying to build a career in, in news reporting. And he is a hero. These youngsters that step up to caring for their elders in the family when they're supposed to be building their career or, or having fun with their friends... They're heroes. Yep. There's yeah. no, you know, nobody, when you hear the term caregiver, you might think of an older spouse, maybe somebody like us that's, you know, an adult, older adult child, which I hate that term, but I haven't figured out a better one. You know, you don't think of somebody who started taking care of their mother at 26 or no. they're taking care of their grandmother at 35. Like my daughter's 31 and it's just like, you know, <laughs> it just terrifies me. And one of the reasons that I do the advocacy, the legislative advocacy, and my my uh, representative does not represent my beliefs per se, but he's on a specific committee that deals with business. I have to look up the actual name of it. And so when we talk about, hello, CMS, Center for Medicare Services, needs to cover these uh, the latest Alzheimer's drug, which they now call Lecambi. Um, mm. Yes, it's expensive, but only because you're looking through the very tiniest lens. You're looking at the very few people with all early, early Alzheimer's that can be benefited, but you're not looking at the family that's also benefiting and the employers of those family members who are benefiting and society in general who's benefiting. That medicine gets pretty dang cheap when you start looking at it through that lens. And that is the angle I'm going to take with him because I don't think he's going to understand anything else until more people become caregivers and understand what that's like. And we all know people in DC, they're very divorced from a normal mm. um, lifestyle. Just, in, you know, not that they have planned it that way. It's just the way the world works. And so we have to give them a big, a big view of what our world is like because they don't have it unless, you know, and I think because they have the feet, the funds, the means, there we go. <laughs> My brain was trying to mangle those words together. Um, they have the means to have somebody else care for their loved one. So it's still not yes. the same. So we definitely exactly. need, you know, we need as many educational opportunities as possible because my biggest fear and my tallest soapbox that I stand on is until corporations understand that this disease is already affecting their bottom line and our government understands that it's affecting whatever the government likes to measure, you know, nothing's going to change. So we're all going to have to stand on tall soapboxes and use every educational method. And, you know, poetry is going to speak to some of those people much better than something else than facts and figures. Like I'd much rather read like the poem that you read to us about bathing. You know, I could put, put myself in that, in that, scenario very easily but you start reading facts and figures to me and i'm gonna tune out so <laughs> uh, we gotta yeah. we gotta come from all angles you know we talked about how the book could be depressing but it can also be very funny 
Do you think we have time for me to read a very funny poem? <laughs> oh, definitely. I think that's how we should end. Yeah. Okay. And and I'd also like to tell people how they can get the book if they so desire. This is called Looking at Boobs with Aunt Edie by Paul Hustovsky. <laughs> me and my Aunt Edie are looking at my parents' wedding album. My parents are dead. My Aunt Edie is living with dementia. I'm 50 and twice divorced. Just to give you an idea, a preamble. On the first page, a photo of my mother and grandmother. Aunt Edie's short-term memory is shot, but she can still remember the name of her fourth grade teacher, her best friend from camp, her great Aunt Millie, Uncle Donald, and the exact number of the house on Observanventek, where she lived in Ma Street until she was eight. Number 46. Hey, look how busty Safta looks, she says, and we stare a while at my grandmother's boobs. <laughs> I smile nod, turn the page to a photo of my mother and grandfather walking down the aisle arm in arm. Hey, look how pointy Reggie's boobs are here, says Aunt Edie. And I can't help noticing the theme that's developing page by page, breast by breast. And I'm wondering if this is a side of Aunt Edie that was always there only covered up, inhibited, corseted, like her own ample breasts, which were always much bigger than your mother's, she tells me now, and only coming out in her late 70s because she's forgotten the reason for keeping it hid. Whatever the reason, her celebration of the bosoms of the women of my family is making me squirm. That's when she looks up, adjusts her bra strap, fixes me with a penetrating hazel arrow and says, if I didn't know you better, nephew, I'd say you're blushing. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny it's and a you, scream and if you've ever looked at a photo album you're like i swear now i'm gonna look at a photo album and it's all gonna be about boobs <laughs> <laughs> so you see there's a horrendous to the hilarious and it's in this book storms of the inland sea poems of alzheimer's and dementia caregiving and you can buy it uh, via shanti arts s-h-a-n-t-i-a-r-t-s dot c-o you can get it on Amazon, and you can also get it at bookshop.org. I love bookshop.org. I do, too. If, so if, you're, make... if you're anti-Amazon, that's where you want to go. <laughs> it's impossible to be anti-Amazon at this point, but it's nice to have alternatives that work. So I will make sure that the, the link, non-Amazon link, is in the show notes so everybody <laughs> can get this book of wonderful poetry. Obviously, we heard two very beautiful poems, funny and and touching. And I appreciate this. And maybe one of these days we can get back together and discuss narrative medicine more. I know neither one of us are an expert on that. So that was our challenge for that topic. <laughs> I really appreciated this podcast. And I so applaud you for advocating, uh, you know, at the government level that that's how you get things done. And I appreciate it so much. Well, thank you. Just for reference, the um, aforementioned, um, what is he, assembly person, congressperson, I, I was never a big fan of uh, U.S. history, can you tell, <laughs> has actually signed on to the letter asking CMS to reconsider their um, nay, no pain, which is very interesting because that action is counter to many of the things you read on, say, Twitter. So it's going to be an interesting um, experience. I don't know that we'll actually see this person. Generally, you deal with their staff, which is a little bit easier, but it'll be interesting. I've never been to D.C., so leaving on a red eye on March 16th and coming home a week later. So it should be interesting. I've got lots of people giving me travel advice and, you know, what what do you want to see? And it's like, as much as possible in a week. <laughs> I'll have to go back. But I appreciate this. And I do hope everybody picks up the book because, you know, it sounds really good and and we all need different different reading. You know, we just need different different arts in our lives. That's the better term. So I and, appreciate this. Go yeah, ahead. We and, and you have time to read one or two poems, I'm sure. <laughs> oh yeah. Definitely. <laughs> skip skip the Instagram and the Twitter for ten minutes and read a nice <laughs> poem or something. So with that, I thank you very much and um, appreciate you coming on the show.
Thank you so much. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.